Read your Bibles with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, as we continue to go through the gospel of John, the glorious grace of God. And before I begin, I really want to make a disclaimer, is that I said at least probably three times that John chapter 6 might be the longest chapter in the Bible. And some smart aleck went and searched it out and found out that there's about five other places in the Bible, especially in Luke, that are longer than that. So I was totally wrong, and I don't like to leave that stuff hanging when I see that I'm totally wrong with something that I said from up here. It, 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 it wasn't nothing that was salvatory, it won't hurt you, but John 6 is not the longest chapter. In fact, when, when I was told about it, it was obvious, because if you remember Luke 1, which goes for so long with the Magnificat and with the, the Immaculate Conception, all those things that are in there in the announcement of Jesus. I think it's called the announcement and uh, the Magnificat. So uh, that, that's a long chapter. And then there's a couple other places. What was there, five total? Mr. Michael? <laughs> He's the one that searched it out. Anyway, I don't want to belabor that. It's taking up precious time as we can study the Word of God. Now remember when we left last, and we closed out chapter 7, right? We're, we're looking at the, the finality of the uh, uh, festival, uh, the, the festival of the tabernacles, or booths. And, and it was a holy day. And Jesus had declared to them, Anyone who thirsts, come to me, and out of your heart will flow rivers of living waters. And that was because they celebrated on that final day, that last day, that great day, which was uh, 737. Uh, they, they celebrated by pouring out great amounts of water on the ground to commemorate the rock which the water came from in the wilderness. Now I want you to see as we begin this that that day is over. And now there's a new beginning. Chapter 8 is new beginning. So the Feast of Tabernacles is over with. And if you would look at that in an eternal perspective, we would be in heaven. The completion would be done in chapter 7. And we would be in a new beginning before Jesus. And quite possibly judgment would be going on where people would come before him. But anyway, chapter 6... My brain does this. Six is the number of new beginnings. Or excuse me, six is the number of man. What happened in chapter six? Jesus called for commitment to believing in him. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Remember? And then in six, 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 many of his disciples went away and followed him no more. Listen to me. They went away and followed him no more. And chapter 7, which is the number of completion, which he talks about living water, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, we're told there in 738, the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. So we know that if we commit to believing in God and, and we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we're committed to him, then he'll give his spirit and he'll complete us until the day that we see him face to face, chapter 7. And then we move to 8, which is the number of new beginnings, and what's he going to say? If you believe in me, if you're committed, if you've come and you're receiving rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, then go and sin no more. This is how it's finished, is you have a heart to go and sin no more. This is what's going on as we enter into chapter 8. Now, I'm going to tell you that most people, most scholars say that chapter 8, this verses 1 through 11, shouldn't even be in here. I think it's utterly ridiculous. It's utterly preposterous. They say that in most of the manuscripts it wasn't there. It's only in 900 manuscripts. Give me a good question. How many manuscripts are there? Oh, there's more than any other literature that you know of. Listen to me. There's more manuscripts of the Bible than most recent literatures. There's so many testimonies and, 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 and manuscripts that it's impossible not to believe that the Word of God has been protected and preserved. In fact, we listen and read and teach some, some uh, classic literature that has far less manuscripts, but we still trust it. It was written um, 
But my point, again, I digress. I believe it should be here. Many of the commentators, they go, it shouldn't be here, so we're not going to say much about it. And I'm like, wow. Wow. Do you see what's going on and you're not even going to talk about it? You're not even going to talk about sinners coming before Jesus and his temple? Oh, my goodness. Now, remember, let me put you into context before I read it. What happened? We had just seen these that were power hungry, these that are apostate, these that are the ruling authorities, these that are, they hate Jesus and they plotted in their heart to kill him. They have turned on their own and they're ready to eat him. This is what happens when you're after power. When you have flesh in the game, you're always going to eat your own because if they don't agree with you, they're going to be thrown underneath the bus too. So what happened? Nicodemus says to him quite clearly, these who follow the law and teach the law and present the law, and these who are telling everybody what to do, he says, does our law tell us to judge somebody before we've actually heard what they're talking about or seen it? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And they go, are you from Galilee too? Meaning, are you accursed too? Because they just said these that don't know the law are accursed. And so they're trying to throw him under the bus as, if you don't agree with us, you're going to be just like them. See, that's the same spirit that's in the world today. What we call it cancel culture. I call it death culture. Because all that the world is trying to do, the journey to sway the wicked one, is kill God's word. Did God say? When you really look at the book of John, it declares that Jesus is the word. That's how it opens up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why is that important? Because it's His Word that created. He spoke and created the heavens and earth. It's His Word that directs us. And in verse 12, He's going to say He is the light of the world. Another claim of the great I Am's. Well, why is that significant? Because the light is also the Word. As it says in Psalms 119, 105. My word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He is everything that we need. He's the great I am, the self-existing one. What do you need? Come to him. So listen to me. They've just thrown their own under the bus. And then what happened, Greg? Uh, verse 53 of chapter 7. As we're completing. Listen, we're coming to a completion. What were we coming to a completion of? Jesus was fulfilling the law. He wasn't doing away with the law. He was fulfilling it. And he's bringing them to that moment, to that point. And we're walking with him on the pages of Scripture. And, and he's there crying out to him in the temple. They have murder in their heart. They sent soldiers to arrest him, temple guards. And what happened? They came back delirious. And they said, never a man spoke like this. They couldn't even arrest him because of his word. Just the way he spoke. They didn't say, never a man was as strong as him. Never a man was as tough as him. Never a man was as fast as him. He ran away from us. We couldn't catch him. Never a man spoke. Are you listening for the voice of God? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Are you learning the word of God? When his voice goes out, his word goes out to heal the land. What happens in the conclusion after the commentary that was given, 753, it says, and everyone went to his own house. Listen, listen, because that is the conclusion of the matter. In the final day of judgment, everyone will go to their own house. Are you with me here? And there's only two houses, heaven and hell, the kingdom of God and the domain of the devil. In the final judgment after completion, that's what will happen. You will reap what you have sown. And listen to me, we need to be quite clear, it will not be your sin that sends you to hell. Because people don't understand that. See, Jesus has paid for all the sins of the world. It will be your decision, your decision about who he is and whether you're going to follow and believe him or not. 
It will not be your sin. Your sin has been paid for whether you receive the gift or not. You cannot blame it on sin. You cannot blame it on those things. You have to blame it on your heart that refuses to believe, refuses to receive, refuses to turn, refuses to change your mind. Even though the payment is there, the power is there, the position is there. Everyone went to their own house. Now listen, I wanted to teach the whole Old Testament for you, but I couldn't. Second, I wanted to go, and this is your homework. You can read 2 Samuel 7, 8, and 9. You might not see the same things, but I want you to understand that in context, David has just become ruler over all of Israel, those governed by God. David is a type of Christ. His name means beloved or loving Okay, he just became ruler. He's like, and, and he built him a house. They built him this great house out of cedar. And he looks around and he goes, wait a minute. Look what God has done. He has done what he said he was going to do. He took me from the sheepfolds. I mean, he made me king of Israel. Who am I? He said, I got to build God a house. Listen to me. This is very important. <coughs> I got to build God a house. And Nathan the prophet, where the word of God came from, said, Go ahead, David, do whatever's in your heart. But that night, Nathan had a vision as he slept. And God said, Have I ever asked you to build me a house? Have I ever asked you to do anything? You go back and tell David, He can't build me a house. But I will build him a house. See, if you try to build a house for God, which seems to be so grand, it seems to be great. i got a plan. I'm going to build a house for God. Listen to me. It's your works. It's religion. It's out of your materials. God is going to build us a house. And he uses David's seed to be on the throne forever of that house, who is right here sitting before them in this temple, who is no longer his house. See, man built a temple for God, and then they went apostate, and they took it all back. And if you build for God, you'll take it all back. It'll be for you later. You'll believe the press clippings, and you'll go, look what I've done. And you won't give God the credit, and that's what happens here. And he's sitting there. Listen, everyone went to their own house, but Jesus didn't go to no house. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Can he lay his head in your heart? That's his power. Head is power. Can he put his power in your heart? Can he put his word in your heart? Can he live in your heart? That's the temple not made with hands. Your heart. You're the temple of the living God. What? Yeah, we're living stones being chipped away at, building a holy house for God to dwell in. That's insane. I know, I didn't use the word properly. People will go, you can't call that insane. Listen, when I'm thinking about it, that's insane to my little brain. To think that God would want to live in my dirty heart, my sinful heart. But see, he's going to deal with sin. And when you believe he's dealt with sin, then he comes into your heart. And begins to live and set up shop and he sets down. And he begins to teach you. And he begins to change who you are. He begins to fill you with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He begins to change you into his image. For his glory for such a time as this. So everybody went to their own house. Nobody invited Jesus to come to their house. He's sitting there teaching them. They didn't say, hey, you can come to our house. I mean, one of the biggest things in this culture was hospitality. But nobody invited Jesus. Have you invited Jesus into your house? Is there an invitation out for him to do whatever he wants in home makeover to make sure it's right? Because he's always going to do what's right. Listen, David, chapter 7. I'll build him a house. No, I'm going to build David a house. He's like, oh my goodness, who am I? And, and he says this prayer and he begins to praise God about this. And he agrees with God. Listen, I mean, you've got to agree with God. That's what confession is. That's what confessing your sin is, is you agree with God. So David agrees with God that God can build him a house. 
and that the Messiah, that there will always be somebody on his throne. And so when you get to chapter 8, you go, wow. David goes out and he conquers like five or six kingdoms, all for God's glory. He's, he's running. He's running this race. He's do dominating everything. And the kingdom of God is growing right there. And David is ruling it, right? The king. What happens in chapter 9? When his heart changes, he looks around and he goes, Oh my goodness, who am I? Is there anybody that I can bestow the favor and the mercy and the love, the kindness is the word Jesus of God upon in the house of Saul? Remember, Saul is a type of Antichrist. Those that are unbelievers, those that are not saved, is there anybody left for what? For Jonathan's sake, which is the grace of God. We're in the book of John. It's a, it's a picture of giving. Yah has given is what Jonathan means. So is there anybody that I can show kindness to, which is the word for mercy, was used in chapter 7 as mercy. It's used in chapter 8 as kindness. It means the favor And one of the servants, Ziba, says, yeah, there is somebody. And they go and they get who? Mephibosheth. You guys remember Mephibosheth? Need to be Bereans. Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul. When David conquered, it, you know, they always would kill all the other sons and everything. So one of the servants picks up Mephibosheth and takes off running. He's newborn. And he falls down and he trips. And what does he do? He breaks his legs or whatever injury happens and he's crippled. And he can't walk. He can't do nothing. His walk is messed up. And it's a picture of you and me. Mephibosheth is a picture of you and me. In fact, his name means exterminating the idols. See, when we realize that we are crippled and our walk is no good for nothing, but the king comes and shows us favor and gives us mercy, and he says, you can eat from my table. What did the king David do? He, Mephibosheth is freaking out. He humbles himself. He's like, oh, no, I'm going for the king. He's like, kill me. And he goes, you can eat at my table forever. I'm restoring all the property that was taken from you. Isn't that what Jesus is doing? Adam gave us death. We were, Adam and Eve were walking perfectly, had all the inheritance of the presence of God, and then we received death, and then Jesus comes, and the king restores all of our inheritance. And so Mephibosheth gets everything restored. He said, I'd be glad just to eat crumbs from underneath your table. Who is Mephibosheth? He is a dog, is what he calls himself. He humbles himself, and then David says, I'm giving you all this, I'm giving you service, I'm giving it all back, and you can sit at my table and eat every day. See, that's what God wants with you and me. He wants us to understand that sin has been dealt with at the cross, and he wants us to come and sup with him. He says, behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking, and if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He wants us to know that sin has been dealt with at the cross. He's not mad. He's not angry. He didn't come to condemn us and kill us. He came that we might have life and that more abundantly. We were already dead dogs. We were already separated. We were already doing our own thing, going to our own house, building our own programs. I wish I had more time to teach chapter 7, 8, and 9, but I just want you to understand that there's only two houses. Everywhere you look in the Bible, everything is confined to two. There's two <laughs> pathways. There's two ways. Either we're going to listen to the voice of God and the word of God and live in the house of God according to God, or we're going to do our own thing. And when we do our own thing, it's the same as worshiping the devil, living in his house. So chapter 6, commitment. If you commit chapter 7, Holy Spirit. Chapter 8, new beginnings, what happens? You come back to the temple, which is your heart, early in the morning, and Jesus teaches you. He sets down with you in a relationship, and he wants to teach you. And there's going to be accusers. There's going to be those that accuse you of things. And you've got to understand that at the end of the day, you're guilty. You are guilty as can be. And so am I. So is everyone. All have been confined under sin. None righteous. No, not one. 
But when we add Jesus to the equation, our position changes. Our heart is supposed to repent and turn so that we can practically begin to go in a direction of go and sin no more. Remember what he said in chapter 5 to the man that was lame at the sheep gate? He said, go and sin no more lest something worse happen to you. Remember we talked about that? That, that, that a spirit, when it leaves a place, it goes into dry and arid places. And then it goes, says, I'll go back to the place in which I was at. And it comes and it finds that house swept and clean and nothing in it. So you can't, just, you can't just say, I believe in Jesus, and sweep your house clean and don't put anything in there. If you don't put Jesus in there as the strong man, that sin nature comes back. And it comes in, and that former state is seven times worse than the first. Or the latter state, I should say. So everyone went to his own house. Whose house are you going to? Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer to all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. So, 753 through 812. And everyone went to his own house. Oh, did I tell you that house can mean family or household? Because we've been born into a family. The word can be, everyone went to his own family. Because you reap what you sow. And everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Verse 6. This they said testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Eight, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to give us a desire, a love for your word. A desire and a love to be in your presence. That Lord, our sin confessed would be cast as far as the east is from the west, as your word says. And we would not be afraid to come into your presence because of the blood of Jesus, because we believe that he has taken care of our sin and nailed it to the cross forever. Lord, give us a desire to go and sin no more. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone went to his own house. Are you going to what you're building or to what God is building? What will you reap at that final day? that last great day of the feast when we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in heaven. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. And where I go, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may also be.
Each one traveled. They departed. They went their own way is what this means with house. Or excuse me, with everyone went. The word went means to traverse, to travel, to live, to depart and go one's own way. That's why I included verse 12 with this, even though your Bible might section it out. Because if we're going to be in Jesus' house, we have to recognize him as the light and follow him. Or we will walk in darkness and think we're okay because we're doing it our own way. Building our own house for God. Instead of just enjoying the gift that he has given us. House can be a household. It can be a home. It can be a family. It can be translated temple. Notice verse 1. <laughs> There's a contrast. Everybody else did their thing and went to their place. But where did Jesus go? To the Mount of Olives? Really? Because he's doing a work. He went up on a mountain or a hill. A place where there's a lot of olive groves is why it was called that. Speaking of the oil or of the Holy Spirit. It means to rise or to rear. It's a high place. He went up there. Because he's tearing them down for us. Well, why didn't he go to his own house? It's not finished yet. He will go to his own house when he says it is finished. But notice this. Now, early in the morning, verse 2, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Notice it's the temple. It's not his temple. Although they were building him a house. Although they built a temple that was supposed to be his house. It was supposed to be his altars. It was supposed to be all about him. And they had went apostate. They had turned it into all about them. And how shall we interpret what God has said instead of how shall we live? Instead of where shall we go? So it doesn't say... He came again to his temple. It's not his temple. Are you his temple? You're going to notice down here in what is it, verse 7. So when they continue, if you continue questioning his word, if you continue, he's going to leave you there. He's going to let you be where you want to be in your house. But he doesn't want to. He wants you to follow his word. He doesn't want you to come and accuse and come and do things your way, verse 6. Try to question him. He wants you to surrender to him. This is how their temple became their temple, not his temple. Supposed to be God's house, right? Solomon built him a house. God's Shekinah glory. God's, God came down upon it when they killed all them animals. And he filled the place. Has he come upon you? Has he filled your place? Is your temple the temple of the living God? Have you defiled it? Are you defiling it? Are you going and sinning no more? Listen, listen, listen. Are you going and doing his work and looking to sin no more? Or you think that it's okay like the culture might teach you. Oh, I already said a prayer. I'm good. I can go do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. That's the, that's the attitude that Israel had when Jesus came and they killed the Lord of glory. <coughs> Salvation comes from our house. We're the ones with the oracles of God. Make no mistake, he's here now. He will come and meet you where you're at. He came again. He came again, it said. Listen, the festival's over. The last great day. But he come again. Feast of Tabernacles was over, and he comes back again, even knowing that they were going to kill him because he came to lay his life down. 
back anew once more is what that means again. And he's at the temple. And what did he do? He sat down. See, this is what man does when they take over God's kingdom. The teacher stands and the people sat. But in that day, in that culture, the people would stand and the teacher would sat. It was an honor, it was respect for the teacher. The teacher would be the one sitting down. Listen, Jesus is seated right now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession, praying for you and me. He's not trying to condemn us. He's trying to complete us until the day that we look like him. He's seated right now, praying, waiting for the Father to say, go get your bride. He's not shaken. He's not moved. He wants you to know that he loves you and he's already dealt with sin, but he wants you to hear his voice and have a relationship and go out and do his work. Help build his house. His church. His bride. He's already declared, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. What happens? We get up, we go, I'm going to build God this. Just like David did. And it seems to be a good thing. So all the people around say, go build. Go do it. Start a soup kitchen. And if it's not done by the Spirit of God, then it's flesh and God doesn't recognize it. And it can end you in a ditch. What has God called you to do? What gifts has he given you? This is why it's a personal relationship. This is why when you see the end of this text here, you're going to see Jesus and one woman. There's a little marriage going on there, isn't there? Jesus and one person. You're not going to see a whole crowd standing there. It's going to be you and Jesus. Listen, the funny thing is, is really we're both characters here. We're the woman in adultery, and we're the Pharisees and scribes accusing. We're both of those things. We come to Christ, and then we start looking at people and accusing them, and, and we want to get focused on them instead of focused on Jesus. We want to get focused on their sin instead of focused on us going and sinning no more. We always want to look at others. Now, listen, there's a whole other sermon about judging. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a whole other sermon about how to restore one that's fallen, how to restore them in the spirit of grace and mercy, Galatians 6. There's a whole lot of things that we can talk about, but that's not what we're talking about right here. We're talking about a new beginning. If you've really started a new beginning, your heart should be to, to go and go make disciples. Wow, there's a good verse. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when Jesus rose, he said, all power has been given to me. Go, therefore, and teach. Make disciples, is translated. All nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's always about us going and sinning no more. Because sin is dealt with positionally, but practically he's working it out of us. He's burning it out of us. He's, he set us apart and sanctified us, and now he wants us to desire in his house, in his family, to be like it was before, created in his image. To be like what he's given us freely. Sinless lives, pure and undefiled. But the enemy gets us focused on sin. And so thus someone comes and trying to accuse him, they point out somebody else's sin instead of dealing with their own sin. That's another, you can read chapter 2 of Romans if you want to. Who are you, old man, to accuse when you do the same thing? James chapter 2, show partiality. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't commit murder. Jesus, or James says, if you break one of the commandments, you've broken them all. So just because you didn't kill somebody didn't mean that you didn't have murder in your heart. If you break one of the commandments, you've broken all the commandments. All of us have. That's why we needed Jesus to come. That's why we needed him to come down. And become our kinsman redeemer. He became flesh. He became built like us. So that he would have the power. Or excuse me. The position. 
the place, because he's related to us, flesh and blood. And then when he lives a perfect life by the power of the Holy Spirit, now he has the power or the ability to buy us back from our sentence of death. And then we see the resurrection, which proves that he did. And if you believe that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, he comes into the temple, and it's really nice that it says, and all the people came to him. All those that were supposed to come will come. Listen, you don't have to go start a marketing campaign. When Jesus is in the house, people will come. Everybody that's supposed to be there will come. None is lost except for the son of perdition. <coughs> they were looking for Jesus. They were waiting for Jesus. They wanted to be taught. Or how else? There was no radio. There was no announcements. He didn't tell them, I'm coming back in the morning. But they were still there. So he sat down. That's what he's done now. That's his position. He's sitting in heaven. Excuse me. Place of rest. And he taught them. Which is what he's called us to do. If you're taught by Jesus, you can teach others. And every person in the body of Christ can teach. Not all have the gift of teaching. Not all have the gift of evangelism. It may not be your primary gift. But if you have a relationship with God, you can tell people about God. If you have a relationship with the Word, you can tell people what the Word of God says. And it's not your power. It's not your ability. It's not that you have to do it according to the world in perfect structure so that they go, oh, okay, I get that now because you did that in points and, and super points and PowerPoints and you did that with screens. That's got nothing to do with it. We're talking about the spirit of a man. We're talking about the spirit teaching people. All you have to do is let out the truth of God. And let God teach them. Because it's ultimately the Holy Spirit who is the teacher anyway. So here he is doing what he always does. And here comes the legalist. Here comes the scribes. Here comes the perfectionist. Here comes the Pharisees. Verse 3. Interesting number. The scribes. Scribes were like um, secretaries or lawyers. And they they often wrote down everything. And I'm trying to think. They... they they defined or declared what the law meant. And so that's how you can uh, get one commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and then you get 30 chapters written on it. It's because they want to explain what it means. When it's quite simple, thou shalt not commit adultery. Any kind of fornication from the marriage bed that's not with your spouse is adultery. It's not that hard. And in fact, in this culture, if you were betrothed, in other words, engaged is what we call it, you were considered as already married. So if you did anything during that time, that was called adultery also. Revelation 2 talks about spiritual adultery, in my opinion, that God is concerned about. He had against the church of Thyatira, I believe it was. Listen to me. Scribes and Pharisees are up to no good here. And they want to twist everything. They're not concerned about the law. Isn't that interesting? Listen, if they had a heart really to take care of God and do God's work, it would be one thing to listen to them. But when people have no heart to take care of God's work and all they're trying to do is build their own little kingdom, keep their own little power and position in place, when all they're trying to do is accuse Jesus and have him arrested and killed. That's what you're going to see here. The text tells us. So the scribes and then the Pharisees, remember, they're the separatists. They, we talked about them last week. They're the ones that separated themselves. There's probably about 6,000 of them at this time. They brought him, probably dragging, because she would probably be fighting, to him a woman caught or taken King James in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Isn't that interesting? In the 
and the word missed, this it was interesting when I, I looked it up the second time, so I had to go find it. The word missed means way. Listen to me. It can be translated the way. So see, if we're going to go to his house, we have to follow him because he's the way, the truth, and the life. But she was in the very act of adultery, and this was her way. So if she's in the midst, in the way. But anyway, the first thing that you would think of when you see this is if she was caught in the very act, where's the man? Was he a fast runner? Listen, there's some stuff going on here that we need to understand. Let me just read the rest of it, and then we'll go on. Um, verse 5. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And then we're given the commentary of man, verse 6, man. This they said, testing him. See, that's what we do when the word of God tells us, thou shalt not. This is what we do when we know perfectly well we're not supposed to. We do these things testing God. And then we think it's okay because a ball bat don't come out of heaven and crack us in the head. And there's no immediate punishment for doing whatever we want to do. He's already told us that our sin is dealt with, that we're to go and sin no more. This is not how we live anymore because we repented. Our mind's been changed. We've been come back, come back into his house underneath his rules, underneath his voice, his word, in a relationship with him. But they're testing him. Tempting is the King James. They're putting him on trial. They're testing him that they might, we're told exactly what they're doing in their own strength and their own might, have something of which to accuse him. Now, the word accuse there is usually used for the devil because he's the accuser of the brethren. So we know the spirit behind it comes from Antichrist, from the devil. They're accusing. They're looking to accuse him. Not her. They don't care about her. She's a pawn. She's a useful idiot. See, we see the same spirit going on everywhere in the world today in order to kill God. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, let me make one thing very perfectly clear. See, because I would have said, well, where's the man at? Let me make one thing very perfectly clear. Jesus is not stooping down as if he didn't hear him because he needs more time. They did not stump God. It's not like he didn't know what to say. You know how you do it when they, you ask a question and you go, huh? And you're really trying to process that crazy question that just came at you, that attack that was just thrusted at you, that accusation, and you're going, huh? What would you say? I didn't hear you. And you, and you put all of this brush in the way of it. Jesus is not doing that. Jesus is having patience with them, long-suffering with them. Jesus does not want them to perish. Jesus already knows what he's going to do, what he's done, what he's doing. He's not buying time. He wants them to wake up. He wants them to reason and see their plan that's diabolical of trying to kill him. I would have said quickly, where's the man? She was caught in the act. In fact, in their culture, you had to actually, as two witnesses, you'd have to actually see them in the actual movements. You really couldn't even, you really couldn't even witness against them if you only caught them in the same room. If you only caught them in the same bed, you had to actually witness the, the actual Adultery going on in order to testify against them. Why? Because it is a sin that called for the death penalty. Think about it. That's final. 
And I was thinking about it in the Bible. I don't know if you guys, are, you know, you're supposed to stone kids if they don't obey, you know, take them out and set up. You're supposed to stone women. And the only people I've seen stoned in the Bible, now, now I could be wrong because I'd be corrected. I just got corrected on how many chapter or how many verses was in chapter 6. But the only two I see is Stephen, and they laid their coats at the feet of Paul. And then Paul was stoned and, and, and was laid outside the city of dead, and, and, and he got back up. I don't see anybody else getting stoned in the Bible as, as this is what we do, and we just want to make sure you know that this is what we do to you people. We get big rocks and we hit you. Listen, listen. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. And if you're going to build a house, you want to build it the way he says, according to his word, on the rock. You don't want to build it on sand and make up your own plans and be against everybody. You want to have grace and mercy like he had on you. Because the number one characteristic that I like about God is his grace and mercy, his long suffering, how he stooped down and he waited for November 17, 1997 for me to come to my senses. And somehow he orchestrated that which I don't understand and don't have to understand in order to come to him. Are you thirsty? Have you been lulled to sleep by the liars of this world? By our own sin that's come to birth and brought forth death in our relationship with God? Let's, let's, just, let's just do a little bit of Bible sword drills. Leviticus Let's go to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. I just want you to see what they were acting upon. And think about it this way. Because we know now that he is God in the flesh. They're thinking he's some type of guy that's trying to, you know, reveal to them some new way. He's a false prophet. They're wanting him to be a false prophet because they don't like all the people going to him. But we know now who they were. But they were breaking their own law long before he came. They were apostate long before Jesus came. He came, and when he spoke, he revealed their apostasy. Listen, we were sinners long before he woke us up. When he spoke to us, it revealed. When he shined his light into our darkness, it woke us up. But are we back asleep? Are we asleep now, or are we listening to the Word of God? And I just wanted to just show it to you just clearly in the law. The man who commits, now I want you to notice, now I know that the Bible speaks in pronouns and they always use the masculine pronoun, but if you will actually look at the character and the nature of God, he blamed Adam for not protecting Eve. So the man, in some ways, he gets the blame for these things because he is dealing with the weaker vessel and he is using the weaker vessel and hurting her. God protects his bride the same way. We are the weaker vessel. We do need the Spirit of God. We need to wake up, men especially, because God has called the men to be the head. We are the spiritual leaders. We're supposed to be protecting the bride, protecting the women, protecting the weaker vessel. And I know that don't stand well. It doesn't even, people don't even like it in our culture today. But that's because we're apostate. And I make no apology for the Bible, which says that the woman is the weaker vessel. Purposefully, God made her like that. Purposefully, God created her like that. Purposefully. And then the devil wants to make her some other way. The devil wants to make a woman masculine and a man feminine. The devil wants to have death culture erase any femininity and masculinity and you can be whatever you choose to do whatever moment you want it's fluid alive from the pit of hell the man who commits adultery Leviticus 20 and 10 with another man's wife he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife the adulterer and the adulteress shall utterly or shall surely be put to death Notice both of them are supposed to be there right now. If they're really interested in keeping the law, the man and the woman, since they caught him in the very act, should both be there. Look at Deuteronomy 22. A few pages forward. It's on page um, 513, no, 313. 
2222, so I guess it's on page 312, Laws Concerning Sexual Morality, 2222. I'm not going to try to wear you out with this. I just want you to see what they were living under as living under the law, what they were trying as their interpretation to come and present to somebody who was the Lord of glory. 22, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel, from those that are governed by God. Now just kick back for a minute to verse 17, or to chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. 17, 6. I should have just went here and left out the second one since they both say the same thing. But I wanted you to see this point right here. Whoever is deserving of death, now notice this is a death sentence, shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So I was giving you two places that witnessed it. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Right? Now listen, because this is important. The witnesses are in charge. Verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Now listen, this is, this is where grace and mercy is installed here. Because if you became a witness, <coughs> listen, and you were making it up, you're not going to have a second witness to help you. Now if two of you conspire to be witnesses and say they committed adultery, it, now you're conspiring, but guess what? You don't, have, you don't just get to say it and walk away. You have to be the first ones to throw the stones. You're going to have to turn, like we would say, you'd have to turn the electric chair on. Now, I know some people have hate and malice in their heart because of crimes committed against them that they say, I'll turn that button on. But this is just one more step that God put in there to make it harder to be a false witness because you have to exact the punishment. You have to throw the stone. Then it goes on to say this, verse 8, New Beginnings. If a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge, think about this, we have a teacher, a master, sitting in the temple teaching people, and they come to him. If a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between degrees of guilt for bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your gates... That's where they decided everything was at the front gates. Then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord your God chooses, temple, and you shall come to the priest, the Levites, and to the judge there in those days. Who's the only judge without sin there in these days? And inquire of them, and they shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which the Lord chooses. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you, according to the sentence of law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For the sentence which they pronounce upon you. Now listen to me because that's the only thing they've done right. Is that this, this Jesus tells them and they listen. He said to them, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And they knew they were sinners so they didn't throw a stone. Okay, we're not going to be the witnesses now. We're going to walk away. So... That's just in case somebody wants to try to turn it on Jesus. See, because people said that this text is not supposed to be here because Jesus made it look like it was okay to commit adultery. And the early church didn't want to teach this because it made it look like Jesus was saying that her adultery was okay. Go and sin no more. I'm winking at your sin. That's not true. He knew he was coming to deal with sin. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save us. We were already condemned. We'll get to that in a minute. So all he is doing is following the law still. It's 
So we find that they present the woman, drag her in there. She was caught in adultery in the very act. No explanation, and Jesus doesn't question them because he already knows their hearts. No explanation is where the man is at, even though in order to follow the law perfectly, that's what you would do is bring them both. And we're told that they present like he didn't know it. Moses commanded in the law that such should be stoned. But here's your opportunity, Jesus, since you've been teaching love and niceness. And what do you say? What's your word on this, Jesus? And again, the commentary, they're testing him to accuse him. Why? Because if he says something contrary to law, now they can accuse him of breaking the law. If he says something contrary to what he's been teaching, he's been eating with tax collectors and harlots, he's been hanging out with sinners, then they can say he's inconsistent and he's not doing exactly what he's been doing in everything else. But don't forget, he's got time to think. He's stooped down. He's thinking. He's trying to work his way. No, no, that's the whole point. He's, he's not trying to work his way out. He's trying to give them an out. He's trying to give them time to change their mind, to change their heart, to agree with him, to understand that this is a bad plan. Maybe to take Nicodemus's counsel. Do we judge a man before we've heard what he has to say or what he's doing? Maybe they, he wants them to, to, to reflect on that counsel that we were given in 751. But we know in their hearts they've already judged that they want to kill him. They sent police to arrest him. Now they're just looking for a charge. Remember? And, and when they finally arrest him, there is no charge. He was still innocent. <coughs> they couldn't find anything to accuse him of. In fact, he's going to say to them, which of you accuses me? Later. So they're testing him. They're trying him that they might have something of which to accuse him to charge with some offense or to be the plaintiff is what that means, accuse. But Jesus stooped down to bend forward, to bow his head. Isn't that what he did when he came off the throne in heaven and came down? He stooped down. He came down to our level. He stooped down and he wrote isn't that interesting? We don't see Jesus writing or reading or doing anything. But right here he wrote grapho to write or to grave in writing on the ground, on the soil, on the land, on the dust, on the earth. That's what that means. With his finger. I thought it was really, when you look this up, it's really interesting. It actually comes from the word for ten. The Ten Commandments. He wrote with his finger in the dust. Now, it's interesting because most people, if you ask them how many fingers they have, they'll say ten, but you really have eight fingers and two thumbs. <laughs> anyway, I just thought about that in my brain. But I think, because most people will say, well, what's he writing? What's he writing? Is he drawing pictures? Is he playing tic-tac-toe by himself or with... The Holy Spirit or the Father? That was supposed to be funny. He wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Listen, Jesus doesn't need their counsel. We need his counsel. Hey, Jesus, Moses said, what do you say? They're counseling him. You ever counsel God when you're praying about stuff? It's okay. You can reason with him. Well, what's he writing? Is he writing the Ten Commandments down? I mean, we don't know. 
speculation. Is he writing down the man's name that they didn't bring? Instead of saying, hey, where's John? He just wrote his name down in the sand. They're standing there looking, and he just writes the guy's name. Rabbi so-and-so. Whoever it was that was with him. I don't know what he's writing. I really don't. And nobody does. But I got a, I got a hint. I got a hint of what he's writing. If you go, we just read this. Jeremiah 17. And I'm, I'm going to belabor it a bit. So start with Jeremiah 17, 1. Because I'm going to belabor it a bit. Since I skipped 7, 8, and 9 of 2 Kings and didn't make you listen to all of that. Look at this. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, not a finger. With the point of a diamond, it is engraved. Listen, because it's not going to be forgiven unless it's repented of. It's not going to be forgotten unless you come to Jesus. So it's written with iron. It's written with the head of a diamond. It's engraved. Where at? On the tablet of their hearts, hard hearts. And on the horns of your altars, their altars, not his, judgment. While their children remember, their, it's, listen, because they're practicing it, they're continuing in it, they're not confessing it, they're training their children and they're passing it to the next generation. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images, their Asherah poles, by the green trees on the high hills, false gods that they worship on every high hill and high place that they made higher than God, put before God, worship before God. Make no mistake, they still worship God. They would come to him three times a day at the hour of prayer, but they would go to all the high places and worship all the other things instead of putting God first, instead of living in his house, being in his family, obeying him, which is what salvation is all about is coming back into the family of God with an inheritance by marriage. We become part of the family of God. Oh, my mountain in the field, I will give as plunder your wealth, all of your treasures, and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know, for you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. He's a consuming fire. We're going to see when he says he's the light of the world, that word means fire. Listen to me. This is the same thing that's going on with America. Listen, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. What's going on right now is worldwide, but America is being given over too. They're being plundered also because of the sin in their borders. And we're serving people that are our enemies. It's the same thing that you always reap when you forget God. Verse 5, thus says the Lord. Listen to me. Thus says the Lord. God said it. It's his word. He spoke it. It's not something somebody else said. You can't twist it. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. And makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Notice heart, that's twice. Written on the hard hearts, the tablets of their hearts, and their hearts have turned from God. Because it's the heart that matters most. We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's everything about us. We can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit in Christ. For he shall be like a shrub, dried up shrub, in the desert and shall not see when good comes, delusion, won't know good from evil, but shall inhabit, that's where he's going to live, the parts, the dry places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. There's no life there. There's only death. And then he says, blessed is the man. Now, why is that important that it's all wilderness, it's all parts? We're talking about at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, where he just said about the water, if you thirst, 
come to me and drink. But if you're trusting in man, if you're trusting in the government, if you're trusting in your own religious plans to build God a house, if you're trusting in other things other than the salvation of God, the power of God, the spirit of God, the word of God, standing before God in humility, then you're going to be in trouble. Verse 7, which is the number of completion, all that was 6, number of man, death, no life. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Uh oh, no, he didn't say that, did it? Whose hope is the Lord, not in the Lord, is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river. And will not fear what happened to Adam and Eve. We were afraid and we hid ourselves from you. Will not fear when he comes. Because God's there. But its leaf will be green, freshness, fruit. Will not be anxious in the year of drought. Even though there's no water sometimes, we know he's there. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Nor will cease from yielding truth. Always on the grow. Bearing fruit in our season because of God. Again, the heart third time, two or three witnesses. The heart, this is what God tells us, is deceitful above all things. Are you kidding me? And desperately wicked. This is what God says about our hearts. Who can know it? And then he answers the question. I, the Lord, search the heart with his light. I test the minds, or the reins is, is one, one uh, text, but it's what's leading you. I'm testing the mind. I know what you're thinking. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, and it's a discerner. It knows what you're thinking. It judges what you're thinking. It tests the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. You reap what you sow. You're going to reap the house you're living for. As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, well, that's a waste of time, so is he who gets riches but not right. They'll be given away. It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end he will be a fool. The fool has said no to God. I don't want to do it your way, God. I want to do it man's way. Man's way is money. God's way is relationship. Twelve, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Now listen to me, because this is the whole reason I brought you here. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. See, they would know this. He was, he was possibly doing in his actions a parable for them to think about this text. I'm just saying, because when he would quote a scripture, they were supposed to go to this text. Here he is writing in the sand, writing in the earth, because they've forgotten about him. They're accusing him. They're not even applying the law, even though they're the scribes and the Pharisees who are supposed to be interpreting the law. And so is he... Writing their names? I don't know. Is he writing the Ten Commandments? I don't know. But we're going to see that the oldest to the youngest go away one at a time. Of course, giving heed to the elders, which is presbytero, that's where we get the word presbyterian from, those that are in leadership, they go away first. Maybe because they're the wisest. Maybe because they see what's going on. Maybe because they know the text. I don't know. But they're testing him. And he stooped and wrote on the ground with his finger. Could he just be writing their sins? Because he knows every man's heart. He doesn't need. See, you can't hide your sin. He knows your heart. You can't hide anything from him. One day... Everything will be open, exposed before him in his marvelous light. And it's amazing that he has taken our sin. So 
So verse 7, he see, he stooped. We're back in John 8, 7. Remember, he's writing. He's not looking for answers. He's not searching. He's not going, oh, my goodness, what am I going to say? There is no wisdom or counsel against the Lord. He's all-knowing. He doesn't have to call and phone a friend. He doesn't have to figure out how am I going to answer them. Known to God from eternity are all of his works. He knows exactly what's going on here. He knew this would happen. So when they continued, it means to remain, to stay over. When they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now this, he raised himself up, has the sense of reversal, to unbend, to rise up, to lift up, to look up. But think about this. This is what happened. God come and became a sacrifice. And, and, and when he was dying on the cross, the Father and the Spirit were there. And when he was raised up, they were there. He raised himself up, his own power. There's no wisdom or counsel. There's nothing against him. He gave us an example. He died for us. He took care of our sin plight. And he's waiting on us. They continue. They harden their hearts. They stuck with their questions. They're still going to accuse him. He's given them time to think. He's writing on the ground. Is he writing their sins? Is he writing their names? Did he write the man's name? Did he let them know more than we can ever know? Listen, only you and God know what's going on in your heart. And they can stand there and pretend all they want like we're the religious authority and we've bought this, we've brought this woman and we've got to judge her according to the law. But at the end of the day, it's just them and Jesus that knows what's going on in their hearts. And you can't pretend to him. You can't play with him. You've got to be real with him. You need to confess to him because he is going to Bring it straight to your conscience. And that's what conscience means. It's co-perception. Co-perception with who? With God. You can't hide it. So they continue. So he raises himself up. And he said to them. He spoke. Again, he spoke. He who is without sin among you. He didn't say, he who has never committed adultery among you. Notice that. Very important. Here's his standard. Because if you break one of the laws, you've broken them all. And the wages of sin is death. And there's a death sentence hanging over everyone ever born. Us because of our sin. Him because that's the purpose he came for. To die. Throw the first stone. Anybody without sin? Listen, he is not condoning adultery. He is not condoning sin. He's saying use righteous judgment when you judge. He's saying be merciful and gracious because God is merciful and gracious. Yet it makes us feel better about ourselves when we point at other people's sin. And we don't deal with our own. And I believe that's what he was dealing with as he wrote in the sand. No matter how he did it, he was dealing with their conscience because we see that they walked away. And they gave up their case. They gave up their accusation. And he didn't have to say anything about the law. He 
spoke to their conscience. You've been throwing any stones? Proverbs says if you roll a stone, it'll be rolled back on you. Because we reap what we sow. We have to be careful. If we want to judge people all the time and judge their sin all the time, that God has already judged on the cross. He's already died for it. Now, make no mistake. I know we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. And sometimes you have to have boundaries. And sometimes you have to say, I'm not going to be around because that's, you know, the Bible even gives us places that they're sexual and moral. You're not supposed to have fellowship with them. There's lots of things that are other sermons, but that's not the sermon we're talking about. He who is without sin. Sin is, again, miss the mark. To miss the mark. And Christ is the rock. Cast the first stone. Throw the first stone. He came to take all of our deaths, so nobody has to be stoned again. Nobody has to be underneath the announcement of death. The wages of sin is death. Verse 8, new beginning. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What happened? He came down, he dealt with sin, and then he sat back down. That's his position right now. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Then those who heard it, being convicted, of course, to hear is to give audience or understand it. Convicted is they were admonished, they were convinced, they were told a fault, they were, were rebuked, they were repute, reproved. Now, whatever he was writing in the sand, probably mixed with, if you're without sin, because we all know we're sinners. And so often, we use unrighteous judgment instead of righteous judgment. Being convicted by their conscience. That's their co-perception with God. So the conscience knew its own heart knew where it was at, knew that it was a sinner, knew what they had done. And they all know that they're conspiring to accuse him. They're wanting to kill him. They're trying to come up with some way to kill him. And even the fact that he might, like if he was just a regular guy sitting there and he just kind of modified the law or had a little bit of grace, that's not grounds for death. Adultery is, but not, not, not if he was to say something a little bit off. Well, there is the, the, the text where if a prophet and you listen to him, there's death involved. But they're not listening to him. They're trying to kill him. Do you want to wrestle with God? Do you want to fight with God? Do you want to accuse God? Well, why is this happening and that happened? If I, if you, are you trying to, to accuse him and find a reason not to serve God? Because lots of people are. They'll say, well, I've got a question. If, you're, if I'm going to serve God, and I don't really believe this, but I don't really believe that, but if I'm going to serve God, why is this, and why is that? He's a big God. You can ask him. You can talk to him. But you need to surrender to him. He's done nothing wrong. He's done everything to help us. You don't want to forget him. You don't want to leave him out of the equation. Is what happens when the co-perception, when God speaks to your heart, they went out one by one. Not two by two. One by one. Each individually 
Hearts reproved, hearts convicted, hearts judged. It's a personal relationship. It's a personal judgment with God. Beginning with the oldest, the elders, the presbyters, even to the last. And then what happened, Greg? And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. He's the only one remaining. The soul, the single. Everybody else has went out. The only one who could judge the sin, the only one that was without sin, and her is standing there. That's the way the judgment seat will be. And I like that word standing. The woman was standing in the way. That's what miss means, in the way. Standing is histomai. It's used three times uh, in verse 11, uh, 13, and 14 in Ephesians in the spiritual warfare chapter talking about standing it means continuing, abiding, remaining it's our position in Christ if we believe in Christ we stand, abide, and remain and that's what this word is The woman was left alone, standing in the midst. And this is what the judgment seat will look like. We'll be standing in the presence of God. When Jesus had raised himself up, to unbend again, and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, these are terms of endearment. I know you guys, remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said to John, woman, woman, John, um, He's given his mom to John to take care of. These are terms of endearment. These are not the same anymore as what we would do today if you called somebody a woman that we take that kind of. Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? They all walked away under this standard. She said, no one, kurios, now, this word can be translated sir. It's a term of, of respect. It can be master. It can be lord, which is uh, supreme in authority, supremacy in um, life. He is the supreme lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Stop practicing sin. Turn your heart. Now see, this has to have repentance in it. You know, Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And in the final picture, listen, there's a lot of things that goes on with the body of Christ and with the fellowship and the different things of, of um, you know, casting somebody out because they're in blatant sin and won't quit and you want to destroy the flesh so the soul can be one. There's a lot of other sermons we could have. But at the end of the day, you and your actions, you are going to stand before Jesus and him alone. And he didn't come to condemn this time. He came to deal with sin. He has paid for sin completely. And if you're focused on your sin, if you're practicing sin, if you're looking at sin, you're looking in the wrong direction. You should be going and sinning no more. That should be the desire of your heart. This should be the repentant heart that has changed its mind that it doesn't want to live in death anymore. It doesn't want to follow death culture. It doesn't want to die, but it wants to have life in that more abundantly. And that's what Christ's house gives us. That's what his word gives us. It's interesting that the no more, well, condemn means to judge against or to condemn or to damn. But no more is when Jesus come out of Jerusalem and there was a, a fig tree that only had leaves on it. All it had was leaves on it. No fruit. Right? Because we're supposed to be bearing fruit worthy of repentance. The tree had no leaves on it. And Jesus said, let nothing grow on you anymore. Same words. 
same phrase. And he was speaking about that was a type of the nation of Israel. That fig tree. They are the fig tree. Solely the fig tree. And their fruit, they had none because they had went apostate. And they were just trying to create their own religion, building their own house. And they would go home and go, look what I have done. Instead of humbling themselves and realizing what Christ has done for them. And that's where we need to be in the church today. Not making the same mistakes of trying to build a house for God. Building a house for ourselves. Building on sand. That when the storms come, they're going to be blown over. They're going to be torn down. We're going to hear, we're going to hear um, be away from me. I never knew you. Instead of enter into my rest. Well done, good and faithful servant. If we build on the sand or the rock. Which house are you building for? Which direction is your heart going? Are you going and growing? You know, it's funny that when he said in 753, when it says everyone went to his own house, same word for go here. It's your travel. It's where you're traversing at. It's the way you're going. And see, when Jesus forgives us with his goodness and he doesn't condemn us, it should cause us to go in his way. And thus sets up verse 12, where he makes another claim. See, in the Feast of Tabernacles, these were, these were things that were going on. The water was being poured out, but there was also great fire. There was also great fire and torches and light. Why? Because it commemorated in the wilderness when there was a fire by night. And a cloud by day that followed them. And Jesus was those things, protecting them, providing for them. At night when it was freezing cold out there and they couldn't see, there was still a light in the darkness by this flame of fire. And at daytime when it was so hot that they would burn up and scorch. And this is too much, Lord, you've given me too much. There was a cloud to shadow them and they were never given more than they could handle. They were protected. By the God they were supposed to be following. And they had visual. They didn't have to do it by faith the same way. They could see his provision. And they still denied him. And we're more blessed because we do it by faith. Then Jesus spoke to them again. Saying, I am ego ami. I am that I am. Again, Exodus 3.15. Who shall I say sent them? Moses said to the burning bush. I am that I am. I'm the self-existing one. He says, I am the light of the world, the cosmos, of this orderly direction. He who follows means to be in the way with. He who follows means to be. I'm going to talk on this more next uh, lesson, God willing. He who follows to be in the same way with to accompany as a disciple and to keep learning. Listen, listen, if we commit, if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, if we're going and sinning no more, it's not a one-time deal. It's a continual thing. A learner, a pupil keeps learning. We have not exhausted our relationship. We need to be in the presence of God. We need to be in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship every single day, learning and growing and going because He's preparing us for what is tomorrow, not for today. It's your daily bread, but he's preparing you to do what he has for you tomorrow. If you're faithful in the little things today, he's going to give you greater things to do. It's amazing that he's the light of the world. Well, he's the word. Oh, oh I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm living water. Oh, I'm the bread of life. Oh. Everything that we need in the spiritual realm and it also covers our physical realm until we see him face to face. He who follows me, he who's in the way with me, Jesus, a person in relationship, shall not walk, peripateo. In fact, shall not walk the whole statement is peripateo twice in the greek 
Shall is peripateo. Walk is peripateo. It means to tread all about. It's your walk at large. It's what you're following. It's what you're occupied with. That's what he's saying. Shall not be occupied in darkness. Listen, if you're occupied in darkness, if you're looking at darkness, if you're chasing darkness, that's death. The light is supposed to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It tells you where you are today. This is who you are today. And then it shines a light so you can keep following the path and you keep following Jesus. And that's why you want to know the Word of God. You want to be in the Word of God. You want to keep looking for the Word of God and the light of God. You don't want to be following something else. You don't want to be building your own house, doing your own thing, because somebody else said, and it doesn't line up with the light of the world. It doesn't line up with the word of God, the bread of life. What the Holy Spirit would teach you from living water gushing out of you. And walk in darkness means practicing. Darkness, of course, and light being contrasted, light being pure, holy, tried, true God, and darkness being evil, unrighteous, all, you know, all the opposite things uh, in the sense of the analogy. Of course, there is no opposite of God. It just doesn't exist. So if you're following him, you won't walk in darkness because the Holy Spirit's not going to lead you to any darkness. But have the light of life. Zoe. The light of life. Not death. And I, and I think this. So listen, Jesus came not to condemn, but to restore those that were already condemned. John 3.17, paraphrased. He came to restore, to redeem, to bring back into God's house those that were already under the sentence of death, already condemned, already dead. It, that's the gospel, restoration into a family. So as the people of God, we should be looking to restore, especially those that think they're in the household of God, and we should not be looking to condemn and separate from. We should be looking to come together and take care of one another, minister to one another, and restore. So when we see something, if somebody is caught in adultery, we should be praying about that. Not so ready to kill them. Okay? And of course, she was a useful idiot at the time. They really didn't care whether she lived or died. They wanted to kill him. That's what was on their heart. So you see the same thing going on still with the spirit of Antichrist. It's not the content that drags you into the physical battle. It's the spirit behind it that's really trying to kill God and accuse God and destroy God. And it can't be done anyway. So we want to stay focused on what? Restoring people to life. Sharing the word of God, allowing their conscience to be pricked when we teach truth, when we live truth, when our peripateo looks like life, it makes them thirsty. But if we do exactly what they're doing, they don't see life. They see death. Because we've been tricked into living a physical existence and seeing we know Jesus. But where is the evidence of new life? Did we go and sin no more? Chapter 5, lest something worse happen to you. See, God's not here to hurt us. He's not trying to direct us out of some place where I don't know what I'm going to do if they go there. He knows everything. And he's leading us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we should be telling people about that. We should be proclaiming that. As witnesses, we should be telling people that. And yet we go out and we like to talk more about other people's sin and witness to that than witness to the truth of God's word. Because as scribes and Pharisees, it's easier for us to point at somebody else's sin than it is to share the hope of Jesus Christ. And it's his goodness, Romans chapter 2, Homer, it's his goodness that brings men to repentance. Not the accusations. Christ wants to restore 
His church should be that light that wants to restore others, even those that have been caught in a trespass that are in his family. So we need to consider the grace and the mercy of God that we've been given when we deal with others who are still in sin, who are still ignorant, who haven't <clears throat> learned, are not learning, that have been deceived by the devil and run back into sin like a dog that returns to his vomit. We need to be gracious because it can happen to us also were it not for the grace of God. There go I. So where are you walking at? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, are you following him? Where are you walking at? Are you winking at sin? Jesus is not. He was not approving of adultery. He told her to go and don't do it no more. He did not approve of it. But he said, I forgive it. And he forgives all of our sin. He's dealt with all of our sin at the cross. And if he's dealt with it, when we believe in him, it is dealt with, it's done, it's final. Sin has no power over us, Romans 6, 6. Not going to all these verses, we could be going to a ton of places. <laughs> but how are you living today? Whose house are you going to on that final day? That great day of the feast. Whose house will you appear at? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, your long-suffering, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up. Help us not to try to build you a house, but to rest in your house, in your family, in your strength, according to your word, for your glory. Lord, help us not to try to accuse you or wrestle out of your hands. We pray for uh, your spirit to overshadow us, Lord, and give us a desire to restore others to wholeness, to tell others the good news of the gospel that you have died and yea, rose again for their sins, and they can be set free. They do not have to be servants of death. Lord, thank you for the picture of Mephibosheth. May we have his heart of humility that we don't deserve. We're dogs that don't deserve to eat at your table. Yet still enjoy the truth and the food as we sup with you. Help us to hear your voice and open the door and come in and dine with us and us with you. Help us to have that love relationship, Lord, with humility and help us to be vessels of mercy. We give you praise and glory here today in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.